I'm excited to share with you an interview I did with Dan Atkinson, aka Flyfish Dan. We talk about his history, about how he got into fly fishing. We talk about some of his favorite flies and pieces of water and how he finds new places to fish. Then we sit down and we talk about what it takes to build a channel to 20,000 subscribers. We talk about shorts. We talk about things like titles and thumbnails. We talk about how to come across as authentic and have your own personality and build your own unique presence on YouTube. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining me um, on this interview. And um, I've been excited to get to talk with you and talk with about your fishing experience and your journey on YouTube. Thanks for having me, Mark. Appreciate yeah. it. Um, so let's get right into this. Um, I think a lot of people would love to know, um, how did you get started into fly fishing? That is a great question. I, I got started into fly fishing. Of course, I've been fishing my entire life, right, since I was old enough to, old enough to hold a fishing pole. But my dad, he introduced me to fly fishing when I was about 17 years old. So I was still in high school. And he... And I think it's because he he started getting into fly fishing himself and he wanted to continue that connection that we have that that surrounded fishing. So he got me my first fly rod and we went out to Dry Falls Lake over in eastern Washington and I caught my first fish on a fly rod. I know it sounds cliche, but at that point I was hooked. I mean, just just the there's a different feel, I guess you could say, when you catch a fish on a fly rod without having any type of real drag system, it's very light, there's no weight associated with your fly, you know, it's it's just a whole different experience. So that's when I started. I was a teenager and my dad got me started and the first fish I ever caught was at Dry Falls Lake. It's pretty cool. That's cool. And uh, of course, everyone's going to want to know what, what flies were you did you use to catch your first fish? And this won't be a surprise to very many people because I've done a lot of videos on this. It's, it was a coronamid. Oh. So the first, and that's why I think I have kind of a love affair with coronamids. And I, and someone asked me recently, I did a, I did a piece on confidence flies and I didn't include the coronamid in the confidence flies because I think that's, that's really a standalone fly that I've done a full episode just on how to fish coronamids because there are so many different variations and different variations, both in coronamids and how to fish them. They, they're, they're close to my heart because that was the first fish I ever caught was on a coronamid. That's super cool. Yeah. So I'm curious, how did your dad get into fly fishing? Um, so my dad, he was self-taught and I think, you know, he's been a fisherman his entire life as well. Um, and he was just looking for something new and decided to pick it up. And I think it was, Okay, he had a. He was friends with Gary Sandstrom, who was uh, part of the. You know, he owned the Morning Hatch in Tacoma, and Kim Nakamura, I believe it was Kim Nakamura, who was a friend of his at the time, and I, s I still think they are friends today. Got him into fly fishing, and now I'm, I'm, I'm trying to remember back a lot of years ago when my dad told me this story, but I'm fairly certain it was Kim Nakamura that got him into fly fishing. And then of course he wanted to share that with me and taught me how. Right. Did he, did he spin fish before that or gear fish? He did. So when, when I was growing up, um, I was always his a partner in crime from about, uh, I want to say it was about five years old when he first took me out. He had a Boston whaler and we would salmon fish together. And I was, I was the only one of the kids. So I come from a, I have a brother and a sister and neither, neither my brother or sister liked to get up early, but I was fine with getting up early. So I would go with him often on the Sundays that he would go fishing or excuse me, the Saturdays that he would go fishing. And we just started, you know, building that fishing relationship early on. So he fished a lot of traditional gear as well at that at that point. He was spin fisherman, level wines, uh, salmon and steelhead, and really didn't get into fly fishing just a bit earlier than than when he taught me. Right. Very cool. And when yeah. you when you um, when you after you sort of first got into fly fishing, did you was that a a was that something that you did uh, sort of for the rest of your life, or did you take breaks with it, or how did that happen? for the rest of my life? So it's, um, I'm not absolutely exclusive to fly fishing. Um, my wife and my stepson, Kobe, which 
uh, a lot of the viewers have seen on some of my videos. We recently went up to Vancouver, Vancouver Island and fished for king salmon. We were, now granted, we were using knuckle busters, which are a similar to a fly reel, but we were using salmon rods and downriggers and that type of thing. So uh, I occasionally will fish with traditional gear, even bass fishing. Uh, a couple times Kobe and I went, went out, I used some of his bass fishing gear. I hadn't cast. Uh, you know, a uh, spinning gear it's just a long time. It took took some time for me to get uh, used to it again, but I would say 99% of the time I'm fly fishing. 1% um, of the time I'll pick up uh, traditional gear, uh, you know, spin casting or a level wine. But so I'm not, I'm not opposed to that. I just prefer fly fishing. And then I also, I started uh, uh, early on when I realized how fun fish were to catch on a fly rod. I thought, what else can I catch on a fly rod, right? My dad introduced me to bone fishing when I was 25 years old for my 25th birthday and realized I had a passion for a tropical fish on a fly rod, which is just ridiculous. If if you've never tried that, and I don't think you have, Mark, if you've never tried that, you need to because it's like it's like hooking on to a back of a jet ski with your fly rod. It's really quite, quite amazing experience. But... I started thinking, you know, what else can I catch on a fly rod? So I started catching salmon on a fly rod, of course, a lot of salt, saltwater species, uh, tropical saltwater species on a fly rod, bass on a fly rod, musky on a fly rod. So I, I've, uh, I've, I've haven't really found a need to go back to traditional fishing because I can do almost everything on a fly rod. That's super cool. Long answer to your question. Right. Right. <laughs> are there, are there any, um, species that you are that you sort of have on your bucket list that you haven't caught yet but that you're looking to catch on the fly rod um yeah i wanted one of the and now let me let me think about this i need to think about this for a minute because i know i'm missing something because it's not coming to me um because i've i've caught bonefish tarpon permit that's what i was trying to remember so i've caught bonefish on a fly rod i've caught um barracuda on a fly rod Giant trevally, trevally, tarpon. I caught, I don't know if I said that already, but I caught like a, over a hundred pound tarpon on a fly rod, which was nuts. But I have not caught a permit. And I also want to catch a redfish on a fly rod. So those those would be two bucket list fish that I can think of off the top of my head that, that I want to get on a fly rod, hopefully sooner than later. Yeah, that's awesome. That's pretty amazing to um, get started uh, saltwater bone fishing at 25. Um, yeah, I was pretty, pretty fortunate. I mean, my dad, uh, my dad bought that trip for me, uh, for my 25th birthday. So it was, uh, pretty, a, a pretty epic, uh, um, birthday gift for sure. And it was, he, he and I, so it was a trip for him as well. So it was just, it was just one of those trips that you, that, that you'll never forget, right? It's one of those things I reflect back often to. It was such an, an amazing trip with my dad. Yeah. Are there, is, is there any gear or anything that you still use that your dad had? Actually, yes. Yeah. So my, my dad recently, he retired in Montana and then had to make a move for family reasons over to uh, West Virginia. So he's in West Virginia today. He still does a little bit of fly fishing. He's got a custom bamboo rod that, that he keeps for himself if he ever wants to get out there and do a little fly fishing. But he sent all of his gear to me. When he made that move to Montana, um, I have now all of his old Orvis uh, batten kills. I've got his several of his rods from all the way up from a Sage 9 weight down to a Winston 3 weight. And I use those rods a ton because, you know, they're great rods, but there's a lot of nostalgia for me as well, you know, using my dad's rods. And I'm thankful he's still here with us today so he can enjoy me using his fly fishing gear on some of my videos, but I use his stuff often. So the, I have a few favorite rods of myself that, that I got myself, but a lot of the rods I use today uh, were, you know, have a lot of great fishing karma because my dad used them for decades. Right. That's awesome. Yeah. A couple questions that, um, that I think are sort of related to, you know, you getting into fly fishing and, and sort of the fly fishing part of this. Um, so one of them, one of the questions that a user, um, submitted was, you know, that you seem to be exploring a lot of different blue lines, streams and creeks and stuff like that. Um, and one of the questions was before you go, 
is there a way for you to have any sense at how successful that stream will be? Are there factors that you try and take into account when you're doing research? Um, or do you just go and you're like, I'm just going to go try this and see what happens? How do I find those new fishing spots, right? The chasing blue lines is a lot of, a lot of people refer it to. And even I've referred it to on some of my videos. I think one of the, one of the best resources that I found uh, when I'm out there fishing, whether I'm traveling or local, locally, is having conversations with uh, people that either work or own fly shops. Because it's amazing when you go in, in a fly shop and spend a little money, and, and I definitely have that problem when I go into fly shops. And I'm not spending money to get information. I just have I just have a problem when I go into fly shops, and I just have to – there's always something I think that I need, so I spend a ton of money, which I'm sure they appreciate. But I'll have a conversation with either the owner – or the person working there. And it's amazing how much they'll share with you, especially if you are now one of their customers and you're spending a little money with them. So I learn a lot of uh, local spots uh, by doing just that, visiting the local fly shops. In fact, recently my wife and I went to Colorado and I was there for a few days, stopped at every single fly shop, spent money. And I mean, I found some gems. I mean, stuff that even people from Colorado we're commenting, where did you find this place and how can I find it kind of a thing. And that's for my first trip to Colorado uh, to be able to discover some of the fisheries that, that I discovered because I had those conversations with those owners of fly shops because I spent a little money was uh, it, those are just great resources. The other is it's amazing what you can find on Google Earth and Google Maps. You, know, you start looking at tributaries of some of the main rivers and drainages here on the west side or the east side of the mountains. If I see something that just looks fishy, right, you can tell from the imagery of cut banks or if the river does a quick turn and there's it's not a lot of, you know, not a ton of coverage where you've got space that you can walk around and wade it. You know, I will learn a lot just through Google Earth. And then finally, being on scene, uh, being on scene, right? Being there and experiencing it itself. And that's how I've discovered a lot of new fisheries is just doing the homework. And it doesn't always work out. Sometimes I get to a stream and I've, I've Googled one before and I thought, wow, this looks great. And I get there and it's completely dry. Or if I, I get there and it's just not fishable because there's just so much, you know, trees and so many things in the way, there's just no way you can fish it. So it, I don't always hit a home run, but man, just just doing the research, I have found some incredible fisheries uh, by just doing my homework online. That's awesome. That's a yeah. th those are some great tips for uh, uh, people to to take away and, and do their own do their own exploring. Yeah, and that's really you know for me you know and I've had a lot of people ask me you know where what lake was this what river was this what creek was this and um, I know one of the questions are are going to be related to that uh, but what I've what I've told people now, instead of just creating a roadmap for someone, you know, to, to go and find and fish this spot, for me, it's really about discovery. And that's the most thrilling part, right? To be able to, to do the homework, to uh, take, take the chance, take the drive, and then discover this fishery on your own. I don't know, there's just something satis satisfying about that discovery process. And that's half the fun, right? When you do the homework, and then all of a sudden, wow, you get there, and it's this amazing fishery. Uh, to, to know that you put the work in for that experience is it's just satisfying. Yeah. You know, I think one of your, one of the videos that, um, that you put out, I think it was something like, you know, I've driven by this a hundred times, so, some video about a stream that went along a road. Um, and you know, I think there's tons of times that I've probably driven that same highway and looked at that, but never stopped, you know? And it's like, why, why, why am I always like, why am I always going to like that big name? That's, you know, four hours away or two hours away. And sometimes I'm passing over water that I never stop and check out. So I, I, that the video that you, that you posted, I, it helped remind me like, you know, take that time and stop and just check something out and, and, uh, and you never know what you'll find. So no, and I, I agree with you 100%. And, and one of the, the side benefits of, of doing what I'm doing today and sharing my experiences on YouTube is it's inspired me 
to do more of that, right? We get very, we get kind of stuck in our ways and wanting to go back to that same fishery that we know is, you know, we know it really well, we love fishing it, but yet we just keep going there over and over again. The, the, this particular experience that I've had on social media has helped me branch out and try new places because there is a what if factor, right? You, not everyone has a ton of time. And if you take that day to go fishing and you end up finding something that maybe doesn't turn out, I mean, that's, that's the downside, I guess you could say. But when you do find that one place, you have this new place, this new discovery that can just continue to, to give you these great experiences every time you visit. So this doing this has inspired me to get out there and discover new places that I'm so glad that I did because it's got me out of my comfort zone and uh, really has uh, given me some tremendous experiences I wouldn't have had if I wouldn't have take, taken that chance on that new fishery. Right. I, I know a question that um, a lot of people want to know is, how do you get to fish so much? So um, now there is a perception uh, online that I fish all the time, right? Like nonstop. But the reality is when I'm, when I'm out there fishing, a lot of times one outing will be two, three, or four different videos. I, I can make a video about the experience. I can make a video about a fly fishing tip. Um, I can make it a two-part video. Uh, sometimes I've even had days where I fish two fisheries in one day to where I fish something in the morning, and then I might have fished something on the way back, and it looks like two separate trips, but it's the same trip. Because I do have a full-time job, and it's a very demanding full-time job. So Amy and I, my wife, she, uh, we're both fortunate enough to be empty nesters. So that's, uh, box number one that's checked that I'm a weekend warrior and I spend a ton of time on the weekends fishing. Summertime, I get a little, you get a little bonus time after work, right? Not so much anymore, but when, when we're right in the summer, and it's staying light until nine 30. That gives me a few hours to fish somewhere local after work. So a lot of times my content will will be a lot more during the summer because I have extra time. But it's it's a bit of a, um, a false perception because I maybe fish one or two times a week tops. And it's generally on the weekends. After work, you're like, okay, I'm going to go fish. Like, do you have like a go bag that you have ready to go that you just are like, boom, you grab it and you go. And like, what do you normally have have in that? I absolutely have all my stuff ready to go at any given time. So typically, I don't generally keep things in my vehicle just because I don't want to lose anything, you know, um, just for the risk of somebody potentially breaking in. So uh, usually it's with a plan, right? If I know that I don't have uh, any appointments that take uh, that, that, that requires any type of travel and I can leave from the office or on the way home, um, I generally throw in my sling pack and I've got a a variety of flies in my sling pack that could cover both still water and river, depending on what I want to fish. Um, of course, my sunglasses are in there, sunblocks in there, all all the accessories that you would need is in this sim slim pack. My net, of course, is attached to that slim pack. I generally have my I fish a ton with either my five weight or my three weight. So if I have an idea if it's going to be still water or river, a lot of times I can get away with just the three weight. Sometimes it's the five weight, but I'll have that in there. And the great thing about summer is you don't have to worry about waders, right? So you just throw your wading boots in the trunk and now you're wet wading. And I'll have a change of pants because, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to wet wade in my suit pants. So I'll have a change of clothes ready to go too. So I've, I've got a system down to where uh, it doesn't take me long to throw my gear together. In fact, it's always together right behind me and just throw it in my trunk. That's awesome. And off I go. How often are your trips multi-day trips? Um, not often. Typically, my trips are uh, are day trips, and sometimes I'll get back pretty late if I'm going Eastern Washington or you know maybe up to the Northern Cascades. Um, I probably do. I would say probably six overnight trips in any given year, and generally it's camping, right? Uh, whether it's to the St. Joe. Um, or over to Eastern Oregon, or, um, you know, even, uh, I've been fortunate enough to go with your group over to the Yakima river. Um, sometimes it's in Idaho and some of the other fisheries. So there, there's about six trips a year 
that would be uh, overnights. And I, and I love that. I love the overnight trips because you don't feel rushed, right? It's um, You can relax a little bit more. Um, you can take your time uh, and enjoy the experience versus, I guess, just a little more pressure on a day trip to, to be able to get into fish and have a good day versus a multi-day trip to where you might have a bad day, but you can have a banner day the next. Right. Does your fishing gear change depending upon if you're doing a single day versus multi-day? I bring more stuff on a multi-day. Uh, I bring my entire gear pack plus my sling pack so that I can switch out certain things. I bring all my flies, which are way too many. Uh, and I'll usually bring about four different rods. Um, I have a favorite rod in that five weight that I use and another now in the three weight that I use that was my dad's. Uh, but sometimes I'll bring my four weight or, you know, or I even have another three weight setup that I'll bring. And it all kind of depends on, it's not really necessarily what I'm fishing. It's more what I'm in the mood to fish with. Right. How often are you heading out and do you get, do you find you get skunked? Um, so not often. I don't, I don't get, I don't get skunked very often. I think, you know, I've been fly fishing now for a lot of years, 37 years now, I'm doing the math right, uh, a long time, right? So when you do something for this long, I generally can figure things out. Now, granted, on my videos, it does look like I'm just catching a ton of fish. Of course, that's the power of editing, right? If I, if I catch six fish in a day, a lot of times that could take me all day long. But when I do a video edit and I have an eight minute video, it looks like I'm just reeling in fish after fish after fish. But the reality is there's big spaces in between a lot of times. Um, so I don't often get skunked. It does happen. Uh, and recently I've actually, I've still posted videos uh, of being skunked because that's the reality, right? It's, I want to give real world scenarios as well because Sometimes it really is just about getting out there and the fish is just the bonus. Uh, I enjoy my day just as much without catching any fish than I do catching a ton of fish. So it's, it's, um, it's a similar experience, but trust me, I love catching fish and I do catch a lot of fish, but it doesn't always happen. And sometimes they're, they're far more spaced out than, than what the videos will show because, uh, I feel like uh, having a, a, an hour long video with six fish would just, just wouldn't be too interesting to watch. Right, right. This question, <laughs> you're welcome to plead the fifth on the first part of this question, um, but the, this is a two-part question. So one is, uh, what's your favorite river in Washington? And the second part of that is, what's your favorite fly of all time? So my favorite river in Washington has to be the Yakima River. And I know it's it's probably one of the most popular rivers in Washington. Uh, I believe it's the only blue ribbon trout stream, but I've got so many memories built in the Yakima river. I mean, that was one of the first rivers that was the first river I ever fly fished. So after dry Fla dry falls Lake came the Yakima river. So I've been fishing the Yakima since I was a teenager and I've got so many memories, just incredible memories. In fact, I even was fortunate enough, gosh, 15 years ago to catch a rare steelhead in the canyon on the Yakima River using a three weight and a small little red copper john. And I'm standing on this ice sheet try, trying to reel in this, this monster fish on a three weight. It was just incredible. So there's so many memories for me on the Yakima River. Um, I mean, I was going to Red's Fly Shop in the canyon when it was just a single wide. <laughs> And that was all that was there. Now it's this huge lodge. Yeah. So my favorite river, I mean, I've got a lot of favorite rivers, right? And for different reasons, but that would be my ultimate favorite river just because of the memories that I have there on that river from the past and right away, right all the way up to where we are today. And I'm sorry, can you tell me that? Can you repeat part two? Yeah, part two was what's your uh, all time favorite fly? My all-time favorite fly has to be the coronamid, and it's because I've been using using them the longest. When I tie on a coronamid, I can catch a fish. I've caught fish in rivers on coronamids. I've caught fish in ponds in coronamids, lakes in coronamids, um, and it's the snow cone coronamid as well. I love that fly. I don't think there's ever a time that I tied on that fly and I didn't catch a fish. So it's it's 
There's nostalgia built in for me because that fly was the first fly I ever used to catch a fish. And I've just used him so much. Um, you know, I just, I just love that fly. In fact, I have an entire box, entire full box dedicated to chromids. That's awesome. Do you have a favorite color combination that you reach for? Red and black. So there is a, it's a black body with the red ribbing. There's like a wire red that goes up the black body and a white snow cone. That's awesome. Yeah, that's a good fly. I hope you enjoyed part one of this interview. If you are interested in building a YouTube channel, stick around and watch part two right now.